Yes, it's my responsibility how I lived my life. I did it. I mean, I did it out of certain patternings. It wasn't my fault. But who's going to respond to all that if I'm not me? Who's, not, who's responsible if it's not me? If I consciously know something, I'm totally aware of it. And I quite deliberately, for selfish reasons, go against what I know to be true. That's very rare. That's actually very rare. Now, I'm not, there's also a difference between fault and responsibility. Yes, it's my responsibility how I lived my life. I did it. I mean, I did it out of certain patternings. It wasn't my fault. But who's going to respond to all that if I'm not me? Who's, not, who's responsible if it's not me? So taking responsibility means that once I realize something, I do what I can to clean it up. That's how you take responsibility. But that's, not, that's got nothing to do with fault. It's, not, it's nothing to do with, not that I haven't blamed myself. Believe me, I have. I'm, I mean, that's, you have to really learn not to blame yourself. But, but responsibility and blame are two different things. And I, I, I just, for me, blame just doesn't work. In fact, um, you know, Hafiz, a Sufi poem, poet wrote uh, was it 800 years ago now how blame is such a sad game it is because we're left being a victim in the truest sense of it there's nothing we can do about the situation connect for me here while we still have a little bit of time connect for me here what you perceive to be, you know, the experiences that you went through as a child and, and how that mapped out to these addictive patterns. Like what actually is taking place in the brain and in the body to create a connection between those two? Okay. So if you look at the addicted brain, there's a number of circuits that just don't work very well. One of them is the uh, endorphin circuitry. Endorphins are our internal opiates. We have our internal opiates. We have receptors for opiates. That's why the heroin works, just because we have receptors. That, but why do we have receptors? Because we have our own substances internal to ourselves that look very similar to, to, you know, to, to heroin. So we have endorphin receptors. So we have an endorphin system in our brain. What do the endorphins do? They provide pain relief physical and emotional pain relief, which is necessary for life. They give us a sense of pleasure and reward, joy, elation. And they connect us to other people. So then endorphins are one of the attachment chemicals, along with oxytocin, that, that keeps us connected to people that we have to stay close to. Why? To survive. So infants have to attach and connect with their parents. And the parents have to connect and attach to the infants. Otherwise, there's no infant survival, given the helplessness of the human infant. So we have these brain chemicals that help to modulate our attachments. So we have their brain circuitry. That circuitry doesn't function well in addicted people. So heroin, Boy, all of a sudden they have love and connection and pain relief and pleasure, which are totally normal human aspirations. As a sex trade worker with HIV said to me once, the first time I did heroin, she said, it felt like a warm, soft hug. So the opiates are really all about love. Then there's the dopamine circuitry. Dopamine is our incentive motivation circuitry. We have receptors for dopamine. We have brain centers and nuclei that work on dopamine. Without dopamine, we're lifeless, we're inert. We lack vigor, incentive, no motivation to do anything. Dopamine flows when you're seeking food or a sexual partner. You can see how important that is. People who are prone to addiction, the dopamine circuits don't function very well. And that's where the addictions take root. 
So when you're addicted to work, it's not the work that you're addicted to. It's the dopamine that, that's released in your brain through that activity. That's what you're addicted to. So even the non-substance addicts are substance addicts, except they get those substances released internally, triggered by whatever their target behavior. So the sex addict gets the dopamine from sexual seeking, the gambling, the gambler from gambling, the cocaine addict from cocaine. But they're all after the same hit of dopamine. Other circuits that don't work so well are stress regulation, circuits in the brain whose job is to calm our stress so our body doesn't go into overdrive. And impulse regulation, so that I may feel like doing something, but something says, no, Gabor, not a good idea, don't do it. Addicts don't have that. They keep doing what they know is bad for them. These circuits in the brain develop in childhood, in interaction with the environment. So this is what we have to get about the brain. The brain is a dynamic social organ. It's circuitry, it's systems development, the availability of receptors for the neurochemicals like serotonin and oxytocin and vasopressin and GABA and, 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 and the endorphins and, and dopamine. They all develop in interaction with our environment and the more stressed the environment is, the less these circuits develop properly and the more prone you are to be addicted later on. So you can see, um, for example, e even already in utero, like if you stress mothers, that'll affect their children's dopamine receptors and their stress regulation. Those kids will be more prone to be addicted later on because of what happened in utero. So, Yes, it is about the brain, but the brain is not the primary source. The brain itself is under the effect of life history and life experience, which also means that if we change our life experience and our relationship to ourselves, it's no easy task. We can actually change our brains. So that's the beauty of it. And the first step is awareness, would you say? Well, but without that, there's no other steps. So, but when you say awareness, what do you mean by that? The recognition of that space that we talked about, just at least a glimpse, not that it's going to be there with us always, but that we are not our wrong patterns. We are not our addictions. We are not these things that are, we are not our father who was an alcoholic we are not these things there we are not our life events they've happened to us i think that that's partly what i mean through awareness fair enough and so even in the 12 step groups when somebody says uh, my name is so and so and i'm a an addict there's some val there's value in that and that the person is recognizing and owning their behavior but at the same time it's a double-edged sword because nobody is an addict that's not who they are. The addiction was a pattern of behavior which came along, as we pointed out before, to soothe some kind of pain. So it'd be more accurate to stand up and say, hello, my name is Gabor, or my name is Drew, and um, I've had pain in my life which I've soothed through this particular behavior. But that's not who I am. That's just my behavior. That's just my coping mechanism. That would be more accurate. And yeah, that's where awareness comes in. So once awareness, the next component, which a, a big part of awareness is getting connected to there was pain first and that pain created the void to go with lack of awareness or un, with, with unconsciousness to go find things to put into that, that void. So is the next component to begin to unravel the pain? Well, you know, the pain? you know, there's no one size fits all. Um, but <clears throat> for me, if we don't go there, if we simply focus on the behaviors, you know, you're a drinker and you want to stop drinking. Well, that's good. But very often that hasn't dealt with the fundamental addiction process in your brain. You've just stopped a certain behavior. And very often people that stop one behavior, they go into another. People who stop smoking very often will put on weight.
Why? Because that emptiness is still there. So for me, while it's good to work on behaviors, obviously, ultimately healing has to do with working through that pain and working through the trauma and, 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 and finding your deeper, truer self underneath all that. Which, by the way, if you look at the word recovery, I mean, I, I say this all the time, it's almost a cliche, but recovery, what does it mean to recover something? It means to find it. You've lost contact with something, you've lost touch with it, and you've found it, so you've recovered it. So when we say, we, I've recovered, what have people recovered? And if you talk to people who've been through addictions, and you ask them, well, what did you recover? What did you find? Oh, I found myself. So that's what ultimately recovery is. But to do that, you have to work through the pain, for sure. It's one of my favorite messages from Eckhart Tolle and A New Earth is that it's in the nature of humanity and largely consciousness to have something, lose it, find it again, but find it at a deeper level with true meaning that it cannot be lost. So we have these things, we lose them, and then we step back into them. I often, I think of that in the context of, of recovery. Yes. Um, let me read you a quote from Karl Marx, if I could. Please. And he says, the, um, the world has long dreamed of possessing something of which it has only to become conscious in order to, pos to possess it in reality. The world has been longing for something for which it, of which it only has to become conscious in order to really have it. In other words, it's here. You just have to become conscious of it. That gaining of consciousness is it. So for me, all the work that I do, whether it's on physical illness or mental illness, not that there's any separation, addiction, whatever, child development, parenting, it's all about how do we become conscious? of what's already in, in here, but we've lost sight of it. Yes, both on the individual level and on the society level, and a good part of your, your work, you know, while we have a few more minutes here, I would love to talk about the society aspect of it. You, you've mentioned before in different interviews, like you go and speak at different medical, you know, universities and even your own medical training, you rarely ever or never hear the word trauma. Right, like that was just not something that was being brought into the understanding. I think there's a little bit of a shift happening, especially more in the last three, four, five years. Especially your work, other people, a new generation of medical doctors who are starting to become more aware of these items. With society being in this place that it is, of a version of sickness, right? It's a version of sickness that's there. What do you see? zooming out as the pathways to that recovery on a societal level is it hap is it going to happen through the medical system is it through individual i would love to just get your perspective on it yeah um well i'm just writing a new book i'm just rewriting it it'll be published in 2022 the title is the myth of normal illness and health in an insane culture hmm like once it comes out, I'd love to come back and talk to you about it. I would love to have you on, yeah. But it's all about, but it's all about um, how illness in this society, physical or mental, they're not abnormalities. The normal responses to an abnormal culture. This this culture is abnormal when it comes to uh, real human needs, and. It's in the nature of the system to be abnormal, because if we had a society geared to meet human needs, would we be destroying the earth through, through climate change? Would we be um, putting extra burden on certain minority people? Would we be selling people a lot of goods that they don't need, in fact, are harmful for them? Would there be mass industries based on manufacturing, designing, and mass marketing toxic food to people so that we do all that for the sake of 
profit. That's insanity. It's not insanity from the point of view of profit, but it's insanity from the point of view of human need. And so in so many ways, this culture denies and even runs against counter to human needs. When you mention trauma, that's given how important trauma is in human life and what an impact it has, why have we ignored it for so long? Because that's denial of reality is built into this system. It keeps the system alive. It, it keeps it, that's the whole point. So it's not a mistake. It's a design issue, almost. Not that anybody consciously designed it, but that's just how the system uh, survives. Now, the average medical student to this day, I say the average, there are exceptions. And as you mentioned, thank God, there's an increasing number of exceptions. But the average medical student still doesn't get a single lecture on trauma in four years of medical school. Now, they should have a whole course on it, because I can tell you that trauma is related to addiction, all kinds of mental illnesses, and most physical health conditions as well. But they never hear, and, they, and there's a whole lot of science behind that, but they don't study that science. Now, that reflects this society's denial of trauma. The medical system simply reflects the needs of the larger society, I should say the dominant needs of this larger society. How to create change on a social level, that's a whole other discussion. But I think whatever I can do with whatever platform that I've been able to gain for myself, whatever platform you have, whatever sphere of influence any of us have, you we help to create consciousness. We want people to be aware of how things are. Take something like the George Floyd murder last summer. And all of a sudden, in the wake of that murder, which became public knowledge only because there was a 17-year-old with a cell phone who videoed it. That's the only reason we know about it. But all of a sudden, people started to respect Black, Black, Lives, Matter, Black Lives Matter. But why did it take that horror to wake us up? It's been going on for 400 years. And it's still going on. So that waking people up, waking ourselves up, consciousness. Now, for some people, that'll take the form of activism, political activity, and it has to, because it can't just happen on an individual level. But I can't hear, I can't sit here and prescribe people for what they should do. All I can say is, whatever degree of consciousness you have, manifest it on whatever level you can, through activism, in your personal life, through the work that you do, um, in your social relationships, that's what we can do. Through all of our own individual awareness, asking the universe, how can I show up and contribute to this world in the best way? You could be a chef at a restaurant and you're choosing to change your ingredients because you want to feed people healthier food. You yeah. could be a mother who's doing her best to instill a new values and a different pattern for a family tree that would continue on. You could uh, host a podcast. Oh, sorry, I, go ahead. I hate to be pessimistic. Uh, no, I don't need to be pessimistic. I want to be realistic. The problem is the chef is a boss. The boss wants to make a profit. Getting those healthy foods might be more expensive and against the profit motive. The mother may want to do her best, but she might be on welfare or she might have to get have a job where she commutes two hours each way and leaves her, care in some poor, leaves her kids in some poor daycare. So the problem is, I know both you and I are talking about on the individual level and we have to, but I'm saying it's also systemic. And at some point we have to look at these larger systemic issues and those are political and uh, social questions. Absolutely, which is why if you have the awareness to even recognize there's a problem and you have some of the means to be able to do it, first starting with ourselves, just like the quote that you shared earlier, uh, which is the greatest gift you can give to the world or your children is your own happiness yeah. is very hard to help the world heal when you haven't begun your healing journey, which is a journey very much so as we talked about earlier. And then within that, the awareness of 
what way in any way that I can, can I make a contribution? Absolutely. Uh, you may have heard this quote before. Uh, again, it's become one of these oft repeated uh, mantras, but it uh, was said by a, a Jewish rabbi about 100 years before Jesus. And he said, uh, the task is not yours to finish, but neither are you free not to take part in it. Mm. And he's talking about the task of bringing light to the world. I love that quote. I, I've heard that before, but I, it's been a long time and it's a beautiful yeah. reminder. Yeah. Gabor, I want to be very uh, mindful of your time and I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and getting a chance to talk about some things that, you know, I'm, I'm going to link to a few other episodes that are there because I feel like in some of those episodes, you very concretely lay out the foundation of your work, but I feel like a lot of our audience is familiar with you. So I wanted to ask you some things that maybe I haven't heard it or had an opportunity to, you know, hear in different interviews that we've had a chance to talk about. And um, I, I want to conclude on one more, uh, one more aspect, which is as a sensitive person, is it fair to say that you've identified yourself as somebody who's sensitive? I don't know if I have. I know people much more sensitive than I am. Okay. Okay. Got it. Go um, yeah. So as the, I know there's a book that has been a big impact in your, in your life. And it's uh, the book by um, uh, I'm blanking on the name. I'm getting it here. Alice Miller, the drama of the gifted child. Yeah. yeah. And in, inside of there, she talks about the, the sensitive child, the gifted child, right? Yeah. So, so really, the the title, the drama of the gifted child, should really be translated as the drama of the sensitive child. But, but, um, and she was a, a Polish Jewish person who then went to Switzerland and lived there, and um, psychotherapist. And the German title, the original title of the book was Prisoners of Childhood. It was translated into English as the drama of the gifted child. It should have been the drama of the sensitive child, but. I'm not, I, you know what? I haven't heard the question yet, so I should stop answering it. What's the question? Well, well, we'll see if the question actually makes any sense. So I will preface that before I put it out there. I was connecting the component of, uh, in your life right now, how do you think about both what the external needs of the world are, like people like me reaching out to you saying, hey, we, I would love to have you on my podcast or other components, and bridging the gap between the addictive patterns that you've had previously where it's like the feeling of wanting to be wanted by people but making sure like how do you catch yourself on the are, are there tools that you have on the path of awareness to say okay i'm playing back into this pattern let me pull back a little bit from the world and make sure that i'm fulfilling my own needs yeah so that's been an issue for me um so number of things one is i've been married 51 years 50 years 51 years now to um a wonderful woman whose name is ray and in the middle of a spate of workaholism on my part not that long ago ray said to me listen buddy you've written a book called when the body says no no you better write one called when the wife says no because <laughs> i ain't putting up with this anymore so it's good to have relationships that speak the truth to you. Yeah. And it's good to listen when they speak the truth. Number one. Number two, these days I've re begun my yoga practice. I do yoga for the last month. I've been doing it 45 minutes twice a day. That's essential for me. This interview would have been very different a month ago. I don't know, it's for you and your, and your listeners to gauge what authenticity or energy or whatever there's there, but internally to me, um, I, I feel less driven and more at peace than when I don't do the yoga. And it's not like I've got it now, I can forget about it. No, it's, it's ongoing practice. So even last night, like yesterday, I was busy working on my new book and I had another interview and so on and went for a swim. That's another thing. Physical activity is very important for me. And almost every day, I, 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 bicycle, I, I bicycle, I get on my elliptical machine, I go swimming, but something. But 
but, but even last night, because I didn't get to do my yoga during the day, so last night, 10 o'clock, I did two 45-minute sessions. That's just a commitment. And I have to say, I'm rather proud of myself, because it's not something I would have done always. But I'm telling you, if I don't look after myself that way, if I don't, you'll find me a different person. I might have all the same ideas, but I'd have no peace around them. So looking after my spiritual needs through the yoga, meditation practices, um, um, my physical needs, exercise, I eat well, I take care of my relationship. Um, and uh, breathe, I, I started doing Wim Hof's breathing technique and I begin the day with a cold shower now. Thank you, Wim. <laughs> crazy Dutchman. Uh, um, all that, you know? And I have to. Because if I don't, things go down. Human beings thrive when we move our bodies. That is core to how the human brain and body function. We need to move. And also, human beings can experience great pleasure and connection with others and meaning through movement. And so you should do it. And to, I'm actually arguing that movement is as central to who we are as human beings as our ability to enjoy nourishing ourselves and sex. That, that movement is just as important. And if people don't have that experience yet, um, what I'm hoping is that by encouraging people to think about what it is that make humans happy, like what are the joys that we were born to experience, whether it's something like the joy of music or the joy of mastery or the joys of belonging or the joy of being in nature, that movement actually amplifies all of those joys. And so, you know, if you have a New Year's resolution to move more, and you're thinking you're looking for like the easiest hack, like the shortest workout you can do in the most convenient way, you may be missing out on something that's going to be much more rewarding in the long term, which is to think, what are the core like human joys I want to experience more of in my life? And to find a form of movement that gives you access to that, because we know that physically moving your body actually allows us to access and amplifies the pleasures of all of those joys that I mentioned and more. <laughs> And because words are so important, and the book is called The Joy of Movement, we have to make the distinction be that there's a difference between movement and exercise. Yeah, although I love the word exercise, and I was really happy. We snuck it in the subtitle. My publisher was worried about it. They were thinking like, oh, people hate exercise, so we can't use the word exercise. It'll turn people off. But you know, the definition of exercise is it's when people choose to move their bodies for no reason other than they want to have the experience of moving their bodies. So the only like the real distinction between exercise and movement is movement is, you know, walking to work. Movement is cleaning your house. Movement is how we engage with life. Like literally picking up your child and hugging your child. That's movement. The expressions on my face right now, that's movement. And, and movement is what humans do. Exercise is saying, like, I'm going to take a period of time and I'm going to make movement the purpose of it without some other kind of transaction or function. Um, so I actually, the, the book is mostly about exercise. It's about running or you know weightlifting or hiking in nature or swimming, the things that we call exercise. But what I'm hoping people will, will do is sort of throw out the idea that exercise is a chore and it's something that you have to endure sort of against your will as opposed to something that is enjoyable where really modern day exercise kind of comes from the calorie in calorie out model yeah. of energy <laughs> inside the body which has obviously been proven not to be the case not that it doesn't matter but obviously it's so much deeper than that yeah. and, and this is a real problem by the way i should say because i mean people don't often like to acknowledge what you just acknowledged so i'm glad you did it there is this huge misconception that that exercise is an ideal perfect controllable way to change your body to like determine you know a certain kind of weight loss and if you are not experiencing that you're failing at exercise i recently heard from a woman who thought she didn't deserve to um, spend money on something like a gym membership because she tried exercising before and she she didn't lose the amount of weight that she'd been promised she would lose if she exercised and so she thought there was something wrong and broken with her and even though she wanted to experience, like she wanted to feel powerful and go to the gym, she thought she didn't deserve it 
because this whole calorie in, calorie out thing hadn't worked for her in the past. And so, you know, this whole mindset that the whole purpose of exercise is to burn calories and that like you can trust the calorie, you know, counter on a treadmill and that like that's the metric you should be observing rather than how you feel about yourself, how you feel afterward, how how much energy you have, whether it's helping with your depression. I really want people to pay attention to different metrics than this sort of calorie burn. And what could be more important of a metric to look at than how you feel, the joy yes. that comes with it. So it's great that it's a reframe because that negative connotation that's there in society right now also really shows you that if you are not burning out, if you're not dripping in sweat, which doesn't feel like a joyful thing all the time, if you are not completely obliterated out of a workout, then you weren't really doing it right. Yeah. And really, this is about leaving feeling good. Not that that can't be a part of yeah. it too. For some people, it does. I really stretch myself. I have a chapter on ultra endurance athletes, which is like the opposite of my instinct. You know, the idea that you would go out and push yourself to the limits of what a human being can do to exhaustion and, you know, becoming physically ill and the like that extreme and you know some people love it and they thrive on it and it is meaningful and it helps them deal with mental health challenges so i i what i want to put out is a spectrum that says you can experience a joy of movement that is relaxing that is low intensity that is like rolling around on the floor doing amazing yoga stretches like it can be that level it can be moderate it can be going for a walk while you talk to a friend or it could be dripping with sweat you're panting on the floor you can't believe how hard you pushed yourself and uh, it's amazing what you're capable of. They can all be a form of joy. And there's no one path that you have to pursue in order to, as you put it, to like be really doing it or doing something worthwhile. Let's start off with some of the fundamentals of movement. What's actually happening in the body? It sounds basic, but what's happening in the body yeah. when we're moving that leads to some of these benefits that we're going to be talking about later on? What's yeah, actually you know, it's funny. going one on? One of the neuroscientists I quote early in the book, Daniel Walpert, he says the only reason uh, that humans have a brain or really that any species has a brain is to facilitate movement. So movement is essentially the contraction of muscles to move parts of your body in a way that helps you engage with life. So I mentioned like a facial expression, smiling is a movement that allows you to communicate with others. You know, a gesture, shaking someone's hand, reaching for a glass of water. It's a contraction of muscles that moves your body in space that allows you to engage with life. This is why movement is so central to what it means to be human. It is, there's like other than thinking in your head, there's literally nothing that we do that's not a movement. Um, and what's interesting is when you take that level of movement from something that is more sedentary. So if we were right now to stand up and do something even just a little bit more active in order to give us the energy we need to do that, you'd see an increase in things like adrenaline, a little bit of an increase in cortisol to help you mobilize energy. Um, your blood would be you know, filled with more energy resources to use. And uh, your brain would give you a little hit of noradrenaline and dopamine to help you stay engaged with that activity. And that's one of the reasons why movement produces something called the feel better effect, which is when you have not been physically active, when you've been pretty sedentary, sitting or lying down, and you get up and move more of your body and your heart rate increases a little bit and you're breathing a little bit more to fuel that engagement with life. The neurochemistry of it and the biology of it, it it's a little bit of a rush and people almost always feel better immediately in like a minute or two of doing any activity. And I think that it's a funny question because you're the first person to ask me, what is movement? But if you think about movement as, as engaging with life and it's sort of how your brain knows I'm engaged with life, it makes sense why so many people just going for a walk, a very short walk, will feel more optimistic. We literally sense movement as being productive. One psychologist I talked to called it the achievement sensation, that literally no matter what you do when you are physically active, the signals from your muscles and your joints and your heart that go to your brain are telling your brain, I'm doing something. And that is experienced psychologically as making progress. Um, there's a sense of moving forward in life or having the capacity to move forward. And so at a very basic level, when you move, it's, it's your signal that I'm, I'm engaged, that life is worth living. And then every, every form of movement has its own other psychological properties. And uh, one of the things I always encourage people to do is like to think of it as a matching process, to think of it as an experiment. That if, if moving helps you feel engaged with life, what happens if you do something really hard? What happens if you lift something really heavy? What if you go really fast? 
what you know what effect does that have psychologically that sense of freedom that comes from being fast from experiencing your own speed what happens if you move with grace like in a dance class or in yoga or qigong what does that effect have on you when you can sense yourself having grace and flow and uh and there's so much more What's interesting, you use the word engage because when we look at the opposite sometimes, especially when it comes to things like anxiety and depression, often words that people will use to describe how they feel is disengaged from life. Yeah. And I want to touch on those for a second. What does some of the research show us out there when it comes to happiness and pulling ourselves out of anxiety, pulling ourselves out of depression, making ourselves a little bit more resilient? when it comes to movement's ability to support us in that. Yeah, so I wanna preface this by saying something. It's whenever you, whenever I or other people start to talk about how exercise can be an antidepressant, can help with mental health, one of the very first concerns people have is that you are dismissing the value of something like medication and therapy. And so I actually wanna start this because I wanna to talk to people who might actually benefit from movement to know that I would never argue that exercise should be a replacement for anything that works, whether it's you know transcranial magnetic stimulation of the brain or psychotherapy or antidepressant medication. So I'm not somebody who's gonna come out here and say, if you're depressed, you should just exercise and it's your fault if you haven't cured yourself yet, you just need to go for a run. So with that sort of caveat in place, um, one of the things we know is that physical activity typically of a moderate intensity or greater, and that just means your heart rate is getting up enough that you have to breathe harder, but you're not completely out of breath, that it is as effective an antidepressant as anything else that's ever been studied, and it enhances the effectiveness of other treatments, um, that exercise is an effective treatment for anxiety disorders, and, um, and that people who are physically active are at less risk for things like depression and other mental health challenges. And this has been studied, if you're someone who cares about data, um, the data for this is as strong as you can imagine, you know, because you could say, well, of course, people who exercise more are less likely to be depressed because when you're depressed, it's really hard to exercise. Maybe it's all correlational. But this this data and these arguments come from epidemiological studies that have followed people for decades. Every country you can imagine on the planet, this has been studied, every socioeconomic status, every age, every physical ability, anything you can imagine longitudinal studies, interventions where you take people who are sedentary and help them be active, interventions where you take people who are active and you make them become sedentary and they become depressed and more anxious. I mean, if, if you're looking for data, this data is really secure that, that movement helps people either recover from or prevent or just live with mental health challenges. Um, and it, it operates at so many levels, I couldn't even begin to explain. Well, I try to in the book. But um, sometimes I think it helps to give a few different examples of the, the way that this works so people can understand how deep this goes. And uh, I'll give you two biological examples that, about how exercise affects the brain, which I think are absolutely phenomenal and people aren't talking about yet. So one of the most recent findings, and this is, this is pretty innovative, only a few papers have been published on this, suggests that lactate, which is the metabolic byproduct that your muscles make when you exercise, and a lot of people blame it for muscle soreness, which is probably not true, but everyone knows, the, like, we've all heard this, like Lactic you need to flush that. Yeah, so, so um, research now suggests that lactate that's produced by exercise, it's in your bloodstream, it actually travels to your brain and functions as an anti-anxiety uh, and can actually help people recover um, from from things like trauma or depression, that lactate itself that is produced as a metabolic byproduct of exercise actually helps with brain resilience and mental health. And I, the reason I love that example is like you can't get more literal than the thing that happens because your muscles work worked hard. That that byproduct that we've been saying is so bad, it's like makes your muscles sore. Like th that actually is like an antidepressant for your brain, and that. You, you can produce it literally in workout one, right? Like everyone is going to produce lactate when they exercise. So that's one example. And another biological example that I love is this new insight that your muscles are like an endocrine organ and that your muscles produce chemicals that they release into your bloodstream when you exercise 
that have profound effects on the brain. Um, one of the most commonly cited examples is irisin, which uh, can protect against neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, um, that it can also protect against or help people recover from depression and trauma. And these are molecules that are literally produced by your muscles when you contract them. Any muscle contraction, that means any form of movement or exercise, is producing molecules in your bloodstream that travel to your brain, cross the blood-brain barrier, and function as an antidepressant or as a brain protectant. And the first paper that I, I think it was published maybe 2013 that was writing about this, the scientists were like, I think we've discovered hope molecules. Mm. This idea that, that your muscles are giving you an intravenous dose of hope every time you exercise. So those are two of my favorite biological examples to give because everyone's heard of an endorphin rush. And sometimes people think when I say that exercise is, is good for mental health challenges, they think, oh, because you get an endorphin rush and so it makes you feel better. I'm like, no, we're talking about like profound healing molecules that you can only get from contracting your muscles and that have long-term effects at, at changing the function and structure of your brain. The more critical you are of others, the tendency is the more critical you are of yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're, you can't train your brain to only focus on other people and do its best job to criticize them, how they might dress, their opinions, what, what they might do, yeah. how they're living their life. Your brain can't just turn on for other people and then when it comes to you, it's a loving, compassionate, right. caring thing that says, oh, you tried your best. Oh, you tried that project, it didn't work out. That's okay, give it your best shot. You were doing your best. No, your hypercritical brain that wants to tear everybody else apart is tearing you apart on a daily basis, which drives so much suffering. That's right. What you're, what you're saying is giving me a chance to give really due credit to one of the biggest influences on me Please. And a lot of what I've already said, but this gives me a chance to really give him credit. Like, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a journalist, Sebastian Unger, wrote a book, Tribe. I think we've talked about that book. Yeah. Um, and um, what he talks about, one thing he cites is that if you look at research on mental health services after big events like an earthquake, fire, after 9 11 in New York City, we think that actually mental health problems go up, right? but they actually don't. That really consistency, consistently you can see that mental health services actually really go down. I think it was down 50% after 9-11, the first year after 9-11. Why is that? And and just for context, that's in the like in the United States as a in whole? In the United States, okay, yeah. So not just yeah. in the New York area, in the United States. Yeah, well. he goes through a lot of different events throughout history and he shows that there's there's evidence that we actually, when we have to come together our mental health problems go down. Now, why why is that? So the the name of his book that he write, that he writes us about is called Tribe. And when he said our 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 biology is still the same biology of the primate and the human throughout civilization that lived in tightly knit bands of people, maybe 20, 25 people max, where you intimately know each other. Now, what that means is that everything we've been talking about, you can kind of summarize is like when you're living in community, when you're actually in an actual relationship, which means you are interdependent, then you have to tolerate each other, right? You can't shout each other down. If, if you're out in the wild and you're bickering, you're the one who's gonna get eaten by the lion, right? Like it's, it's the band that sticks together and just sticking together means we have to tolerate each other. So there's all these virtues and skills like courage, bravery, as well as like virtues of restraint, like temperance, patience, humility, right? Virtues of the heart, compassion, loving kindness, curiosity. All those things are requirements to be part of a group. So when you, when you have to enact those innate capacities we have in us, because they are innate, they're not constructs, right? They're actually part of our biological, they, they emerge from our, bi our biology, is that we have to be patient with each other. We have to have compassion for each other. Otherwise, we can't work in groups together. Those virtues, those qualities are precisely the ones that are protective for depression, for anxiety, for PTSD, right? These depression, th th these are all states that we are temporarily in 
right? We can go into deep states of grief naturally. We're supposed to go through grief in order to endure loss. Why do we become depressed? You look at you look at that. There's factors that determine who gets depressed and who doesn't. There are genetic predispositions, but they're they're not f- our fate. These factors that protect us take us through difficult experiences, which is what we're designed for: is difficulty, right? And that's what protects us. And that's why when we have to be there for each other, we actually become optimally mentally healthy for ourselves. That's his. Main argument to give yeah. him credit again, yeah, which yeah. is which was which was a huge influence on me when I said I wanted to create my own model, and we we we've talked about community being the core of it, is is to really see that science as what's playing out within us and between us, and that's the real story of trauma and stress and why we keep getting sicker and sicker. Um, when when you think about the takeaways that are there that you that you share with folks from the influence of that that work on you. For the people who are listening here, you know, we're talking about society, we're talking about sort of big picture. How do we begin to think of our life through that lens? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're making me think of like our, you know, I think all doctors have their favorite stories to tell of clients that that um and I say it's a favorite cuz they're not as all as dramatically, um, as dramatically successful, but they they this story kind of embodies the model, and whether it's as dramatic as this story or it's a slow pace in other people, it's actually the same story to me of when you see people succeed in recovering from mental illness, where d- that depression becomes the last time they get depressed or they they stop having OCD and they can get off medication. So let's 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 call this client Mary. Um, Mary, um, daughter of a of a man with severe schizophrenia, growing up, her father, who she loved loved so much, her being the most sensitive of the kids, means she has been the most gifted, and at the same time, the one who suffered the most from that stressful environment growing up and suffered the most seeing his pain as he eventually either died in very early death or may have even committed suicide because of how severe the schizophrenia was. He was very, very successful, which dramatized for her the pain of his decline and inability to keep keep his job. So she has struggled with depression all of her life. Um, I met her in her late 40s, very successful um, uh, clothing designer, um, many, many relationships, but could not let anybody get too close and um, suffered with depression. And w- when I met her, the first thing was helping her see that trauma was actually what underlied this, that the, the first thing that happened was how overwhelming and terrifying and isolate, alienated she, w- she became witnessing her father's decline and not having anybody she could turn to for help. Again, in a nuclear family, there's mom and dad and a couple kids, and there was nobody else. So that meant in her moments of terror and what's happening to dad, there wasn't five, 10 people she could think of that she could run to and get help from, right? Um, And she suffered with chronic panic attacks. And one thing I had at that point felt was so helpful, rather than waiting for somebody to come in week after week and say, yeah, you know, it's Friday today. Well, Tuesday I had a panic attack. Let's, and then we talk about the panic attack. I would tell people, text me if you're in that situation. And rather than taking, you know, Ativan or Xanax, and then we talk about it three days later, let's see what we can do differently in that moment if I'm there for you, right? And if you give me at least an hour, I can give you at least five minutes because I at least got five, 10 minutes between each client. And, um, because I like to see people get better. That's my thing, is people getting better um, rather than we talk about it week after week, month after month. So person who's had 20, 30 years of panic attacks calls me from the um, parking lot of, of a, I don't know, Home Depot, and she's having a panic attack. I won't go into what triggered it, but she called me and I talked her through breathing exercises in that moment. Right. 
helped her move through that panic attack and, and actually resolve it on her own naturally. So empowered her to regulate her body differently. But she never had a panic attack again. Now, why is that? She never had a panic attack again because that core trauma of reaching out, running to somebody to get help that she couldn't do as a kid, that's what was frozen in her body. That's what was the panic, is that when it comes down to fight or flight and I've got to deal with something stressful, I'm all alone. And ha having that new experience, um, she still though continued to be depressed. She still continued to carry pain in her heart. How could she, how could she live, how could she trust and live in a society that lets a man decline like that? The pain in her heart, there's a, there's a new term that the VA is using called moral injury to explain why a lot of drone operators who actually have no risk to their lives. They're sitting in Washington dropping a bomb in Afghanistan, but they develop PTSD-like symptoms. And it's being called moral injury that we, we actually can become sick when our sense of the values our society lives by are not in line with what feels right to us, right? I think that's what she suffered from, moral injury. And she couldn't move through her grief and, and reestablish connection with other human beings in terms of intimacy. The big change, and this was like two, three years I worked with her, just really trying to help her open her heart, open her heart, open her heart, nothing. Um, then her sister had a, a child. So when her sister got pregnant and had a child and this new child came into the family, now the conversation was different because now the conversation became, now you are the adult that a child is growing up watching. <clears throat> what is it like for that child to see you and what you believe in how you feel? Now your decision changes. Now it's not just about you, right? So we tapped into something purposeful and meaningful. It's not enough for us to change for ourselves. I think that's why self-help books just more and more and more because it doesn't tap into what really motivates us. You know, we, we need to have a purpose. And it, then it mattered. Now it matters for me to make that tough decision. Do I risk opening my heart or not? It's really not enough. I can live with bitterness to the end of my life and pain. But can I hurt somebody else? Can I hurt my niece, right? And and she she was off medication at that point within six months and I I hear from her time to time just with positive news. But that 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 story really moves me a lot. Yeah. The idea that again, purpose seems so simple and yet so big, but can be such a central part of the healing process. Like since the dawn of age, humanity has wondered like, what's our purpose? Like, why do I belong? Why am I here? And even though many of us have a lot of act activity in our lives. We have things to do. We have places to show up. Sometimes people just don't even feel like they have a purpose yeah. or they're not sure what that purpose is. I want to jump to something that you said earlier in the interview that we can expand on here after hearing that story, which is that you shared that a big part of your message for people who come in, and I've heard you say this in, in interviews too, is that there's a reason you're you're hurting. It's not just, we, we can't just chalk everything up to a chemical imbalance and then throw everything else out the window. Yeah. There's a reason you're in pain. There was a story that you shared on the podcast last time that I thought was really powerful. I'd love you to share it again. It was uh, you being in the rounds and there was a woman that came in that I think that had just found out that her husband was cheating, cheating on, on her. her. Yeah. yeah. Could you share that story? Yeah, it's it goes to the story like the OC the, the woman with OCD whose parents who got sick when her parents got divorced. It's it's the way where we are science and healthcare is creating culture and creating beliefs. Like this this I was an intern I was in medical school and I was following a primary care doctor 
who was a wonderful doctor. And, um, you know, part of watching her have this conversation with this woman was seeing how earnest and well-meaning she was. Um, so the woman came in and, and, and started to describe symptoms of that sounded like depression. She was sad, low energy, not eating as much, not deriving joy in anything. Um, and the woman offered up that recently her husband, she found out her husband had been cheating. Why? Because he came home and said, I, I have AIDS. I found out that I have HIV. Sorry, HIV. And he had to then report how he got it, right? And the woman, the doctor went straight to, well, a lot of times we, um, you know, these are, you know, depression is not in our control. You know, we have a chemical imbalance and um, it causes us to be prone to depression. And, and there's great medications that can solve that. Um, and, and, and as well-meaning as she was, I just thought that was so wrong. Um, wrong to do that. Wrong because of what it communicates, right? It communicates that your authentic and just protest, right? Our symptoms are often protests. We're talking about outrage. You know, there's an outrage in her. You know, I'm sure she had children. Well, what, what did this man do um, and what risks he brought into their home? And, you know, it, so you, there's one story that looks at the symptom, calls it a disorder and says there's something wrong with you, right? And then says there's something outside of you that can fix it, right? There's another story. And, and by the way, that story has, you know, that says, and you need to be on medication for a life. I've had people burst into tears when I say to them, you can recover. They say, I, I then they were, and they say, I still remember the, the, the person in the, in the, in the, in the clinic five years ago who said to me, you have generalized anxiety and you're going to need to cope, manage this for life. Right. So one story is there's something wrong with you. The other story is that you're what we're calling a symptom is actually your health. That's actually your health. It's her health that is causing, it's her health that is low, sad, not able to eat, not derive joy. It's not time for business as usual. It's time for, wait a second, something really huge happened and I need to reflect. I need to figure out what's going on. I need to turn inward, right? that protest, we're, we're pathologizing, right? We're pathologizing the signals that come from the best parts of us. We grieve for that which we cherish. We mourn for that which is most sacred to us, right? And then if we call grief and mourning depression, not only are we pathologizing what it is to be human, right? Um, but we're also suppressing a signal that alerts us as a community to what needs to be addressed, right? What's going on that this man is out there getting sick and why is he unhappy that he, and he's going somewhere else? What, what's happening? If you live in a group of people and you're in it together, well, then you, you don't just cut somebody out either. You, you, we, we, we try and figure out what's going on. And these signals are what bring us together to solve problems, right? I wonder, you know, for, for so many folks who are listening and hearing about your work, in this instance with this woman, hers was an, an event, but that event was a traumatic event. And if we yeah. don't deal with that trauma, it's very difficult to move on. And when I say deal with it, that's just the terms that I'm using right now. It's actually leaning into it, feeling it, going through it, our body getting sick because it's actually crying out for help from other people to support. And sure, sometimes medication can be a part of that process that's there, you know better than anybody else, but there's also more that's needed. Yeah. For, for most folks, would you say that are 
in the mental health, like in the category where they're struggling with some version of mental health, do you feel that the vast majority of it is childhood traumas that have not been properly looked at and addressed for the impact that they had on that person? Like when you look at society today, do you feel that most of what people are going through is some version of childhood trauma? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one precedes the next. Like we're we're living in a progressively more dysregulated way, right? If 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 fifty years ago, in if in the fifties we we reduce the number of eyes that a child experiences looking out for them, if in the eighties it became okay for the two people running the village to walk away. Um, if in the 90s and early 2000s, then that one parent or two parents might be looking at their phone half the time that you're around as a child growing up. We're, 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 we are, we're challenging our nervous systems to self-regulate in more and more diminished experiences. So trauma doesn't have to be somebody physically abused me, although that's a lot of it. It's also just high levels of adversity um, in childhood set in early childhood. Let's let's start there. If it's in the first two to three years, that's when the brain, especially the brain stem, which is where the fight or flight stress response system. So we talk about inflammation on probably you know a lot of your podcasts. You know we talk about the stress response, and that's what ignites inflammation. Well, that all comes from the brain stem not in the higher thinking part of our brain. Fight or flight is in the brainstem and that's still developing up until the age of three. In those first three years, um, if the environment is not regulated, if the environment is not moderately, predictably, rhythmically um, stressful, we need stress to grow, but we need stress in the kinds of predictable rhythms, right? I can track my mom's coming and going. I can track my dad's coming and going. Um, that alters the brainstem. It sensitizes it, right? So it sensitizes it where dysregulation, chaos is actually what I need to pay attention to. I need to be able to thrive, which means I should stay on edge. It's kind of like you can say the brainstem is like um, the the, the 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 government organizations that are managing um, the pandemic, right? If numbers of cases of COVID are going up, we go from yellow, you know, we go from green to orange to yellow to red, right? So we respond to regulate the threat. A healthy brainstem is doing the same. It's sensing the internal environment and the external environment and Ideally, when there's a threat, it mounts a response. Well, if it's chaotic, then it's better to be on edge. It makes sense to actually never relax. If day-to-day -day life is chaotic, it's better to not actually relax because that's not survival. That's not the best for our survival. So then the brainstem becomes naturally just sensitized. Now, that person needs threat then to feel safe because it's not in response to a situation anymore. It's just how my body rolls. It's how my body functions. We're used to the chaos. We need the chaos regularly in our life to yeah. feel normal. Right. And so that I think is why we're on this spiral of going faster and faster. That's why I think the biggest addiction is actually workaholism. That's why we are happy to have technology that lets us, you know, respond to emails in bed at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, we, we need dopamine. We become a, we need that dopamine hit partly because that's how we feel at peace, right? Many people just can't sit still anymore. So I think that there's a low grade level of advert. I, I think that there's a lot more people suffering even um, and have societal sanctioned ways of regulating a dysregulated nervous system. The path to happiness is paved with money and stuff. You know, if I could just earn a little bit more, get the perfect job, get the perfect house, like we think that we need to have better circumstances to be happier, especially in terms of money and material possessions. 
Um, you know, is that really the case? Well, you know, if you're listening to this podcast and you can't put a roof over your head because you don't have enough money or you can't put food on the table, yes, definitely getting access to more financial resources is essential. It's going to be huge for your well-being. But, you know, if you're reasonably middle class and you're not facing those issues, the data really suggests that more money isn't going to make us as happy as we think. Um, one of the studies that I talk a lot about in class suggests that right now in the U.S., if you're earning around $75,000, then even doubling or tripling your salary isn't going to increase your positive emotion. It's not going to reduce your negative affect. It's not even going to reduce your stress levels. Like, we just don't realize that money isn't going to have the kind of bang for our buck, no pun intended, on our well-being that we often think. Um, the same is true for material possessions. Um, you know, many of us think like if I could just get the perfect house or like a super fancy car, I would, you know, be happier or feel better. Turns out there is a correlation between materialism and happiness, but it's a negative correlation. What does that mean? That means as you become more materialistic, as you seek out more material stuff, on average, your happiness goes up, goes down rather than goes up. So like the material stuff isn't working in the way we think. And so I think this is critical. I think, you know, society is selling us a bill of goods that like this is the path to happiness, but by and large, it's wrong. And I think that's really critical. It means many of us have internalized these intuitions. So it's not like we're not working on our happiness. We're actively going out and trying to do that, but we're just doing it in this wrong way. And all that work we're putting in is at an opportunity cost of investing in the stuff that really could make us happy. I find looking back at history is a great way for me to understand the current events that are happening, both with systemic racial injustice and also when it comes to like happiness. So we talk about society selling us this idea. If you look back in modern human history, there wasn't always this idea that material possessions or money would make us feel this way, would give us a thing that we're missing, would fill the void. What do you think are key events when you look back at history that started to take us in that direction that materialism was the way to fill the happiness voids? Yeah, well, I mean, with the caveat that I'm no historian, right? I'm much better at the psychological biases than kind of where they came from. I mean, I think there are a couple of things that are pretty huge here. Um, one of them is like the Industrial Revolution, right? Um, you know, we oftentimes look back in history and be like, oh, this was such a wonderful time. And to be fair, if you, you know, rewind to the Industrial Revolution, you know, a lot more systemic <laughs> injustice, a lot more racism, a lot more of all the isms we're talking about now. But there were still a few things that they had back then that were pretty good. Like as we bring in this idea that, you know, the, that companies can control time, that we're supposed to be working all the time, we're supposed to be making money all the time. Um, you know, those kinds of ideas, I think, messed with the typical notions that we had. You know, one of them isn't necessarily what we're buying and what we're spending money on, but just how we're spending our time. You know, that work is king, that productivity is king, right? That, you know, we're kind of put, putting a price tag on the way we spend our time. And it's, you know, kind of allowing us to overvalue like productivity and, you know, what good capitalism would want us to do over things like helping other people, spending time with other people, you know, just simply being present, leisure and just doing nothing, right? So I feel like, you know, that it, if there was one step on a kind of bad path that put us on there, you know, I think of what life was like then. Um, and as part of my podcast, I did an interesting interview with uh, Tom Hodgkinson, who uh, started a company called The Idler. Um, so he's a self-proclaimed idler. He kind of wants to fight the cult of busyness that so many of us face. And I feel like his fight is a really hard fight, you know, especially if I look out at my students today who are just like working incredibly hard. And if anything, when they finally get some leisure time are almost like anxious because they're not you know, sure what to do with themselves anymore. Um, and that's just kind of heartbreaking to see up close. But I think you know, it's a feature of society that again, we're kind of we're fed these intuitions that you know, if we're not being productive, we really need to be anxious. And you know, just sitting around and being still and doing nothing, like how are you gonna buy stuff if you do that, right? And you know, so I think these notions kind of do seep in much more deeply than we expect. So we hit on the first one, which is materialism and money and what that looks like. What was the next big one or one of the big ones that you were sharing with the students where there was this aha moment in terms of what the evidence supported or didn't support when it came to our internal happiness? Yeah, I think another one that was really hard for them, another kind of mistaken intuition they have is about their grades, 
right? You know, especially at Yale, you know, there's a sense that like, you know, happiness comes from, you know, a perfect transcript, like happiness comes from all those straight A's. And I think my students more so than maybe any other students on the planet benefited a lot by having that intuition over time. But that's another spot where the data really go in the opposite direction. Um, there's evidence from uh, the education researcher Alfie Cohn and his colleagues that there's an inverse correlation between good grades and happiness. In other words, the kids that are getting the best grades right now in high school are actually the ones who statistically speaking might be the least happy. Um, Cohen has data that they're also uh, the least optimistic and have the lowest levels of self-worth, which again is not what we think, but you know, by making education all about getting perfect grades and these external rewards, Basically, what we've done is that we've taught students that, you know, there's not an internal reward for learning. It's this external thing, you know, you can get the perfect grades and get into the perfect school and get the perfect job and so on. And that does a couple things. One is it makes students really anxious, right? Like they get really scared that they're not going to reap the spoils of this war, you know, in terms of getting perfect grades. Um, but it also turns like what should be kind of fun, like learning about all these cool concepts into work. Right. It moves students away from what they really want to study and puts them in the mindset of like, well, how can I, you know, use my education to do something in the world? It makes them all pre-professional. Um, you know, it has a whole host of consequences to the educational system and how much fun it is for students that I think ultimately make people less good people. And, and the data are starting to suggest less creative people. You know, our students are who are really worried about grades will pick, you know, the easiest paper to do, you know, because that's the best way to get what they're shooting for, which is the perfect grade. Um, it makes it more likely the data really suggests that students will cheat because if the point isn't to learn the material, if the point is just to get a perfect grade, then, you know, if you can get away with it, you know, that's a really good way to do it. And so the structures that we've created and the prioritization that we have about, you know, perfect grades and productivity at all costs, I think is really hurting education and it's really hurting our students' emotional health too. And so much of that just comes back to expectations, expectations from parents, expectations from kids, and also expectations of the school systems that people were brought in. If you had a magic wand, Harry Potter style, and you could look at things through a different lens, starting from the earliest education, what would be some of the things that you would bring in that could reorient us and still help us value hard work and studying to master certain subjects, but maybe re- why are some of these expectations that not just kids have, but the families and the school systems around them? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I would do is just like get rid of grades, which sounds like, you know, apocryphal, like how, you know, like how could you possibly do that? Um, but then if you really look back, grades actually haven't been around for that long. In fact, they were embarrassingly invented at, at Yale um, for like long ago, President Ezra Stiles back in the 1700s just decided, hey, I should scribble down who did what in this class that I was teaching. And that uh, he scribbled it down at four different levels, uh, which he wrote down in Latin. And that kind of translated eventually into the 4.0 we know today. But, but what that means is grades are only a couple hundred years old. You know, we've been educating people for a long time before them. And I think that's what we need to go back to. You know, you, you ask the question, like, what could pe get people to want to learn and be productive, you know, in the absence of those rewards? And I think, like, naturally, humans are a curious species. Like, we want to learn stuff. Like, we get internal rewards from figuring stuff out. And the problem is that when you slap an external reward on something, all of a sudden it becomes something you have to do. You're not just doing it because you like it anymore. And that can bring in all the kind of feeling forced to do it and the rebellion and the anxiety that comes with grades. Um, but if you look at how kids learn early on, like they want to be learning until you slap a grade on it. Um, some wonderful early studies back in the 1970s looked at this in, in little kids where they gave little kids little puzzles to do, little anagrams. Um, and some were super easy and some were really hard. And normally what happens is students want to do the ones that are like as hard as they can possibly do, but still get it, right? Where they're really kind of pushing themselves. Those are the ones that kids find most fun. But then these researchers then did maybe what you're expecting, which is that they now slap a grade on it. So instead of just doing it for fun, you're going to get graded on these anagrams. What happens? All of a sudden, students would rather do the easy ones. Like the hard ones are just scary because like, you know, you don't want to show that you're a not smart person, you know, in my air quotes. And again, what that suggests is that the act of doing grading is killing something that's deep down, which is that like we all have a natural tendency to want to learn and be creative and share our ideas with others. But once we put people in a grading context, some of that stuff goes away. Mm. Seth Godin, uh, the author and uh, 
you know, just philosopher. I think of him as a philosopher. He has this uh, great TED talk. I think it's called Stop Stealing Our Dreams, where he goes into the origin story of school and how school in our modern day and sense was really a byproduct of the industrial complex wanting to raise competent enough workers who could read instructions, follow the rules. So school initially was designed around being obedient and memorization, all the things that you needed to work in a factory at a higher level, going from the farm to the factory level. And that's why so much emphasis was placed on memory and, and just following instructions. And I often think about that when it comes to, you know, he has this powerful question in the TED Talk. He says, we have to ask ourselves, what is school for? And when we look at a lot of education, you would hope that education was for the contribution of not just our growth, but our own happiness so we can be better contributors to the world. And anytime we forget, it's always good to go back to the basic questions and really ask yourself, like, what's the point of all this? What's the point of everything around us? And why are we here? Yeah. And I think that can be really powerful, right? In, in two different ways. One is, uh, one is relevant to the conversation that we're having right now in terms of anti-black racism and anti-black violence, right? You know, what, what is law enforcement for? And when you kind of dig in, you look and you're like, oh, it was kind of to like, you know, make sure the slaves stayed with where they were supposed to be, you know, doing their work so that capitalism could continue and companies could make money. You're like, oh, when you look at the history, I think that's true for education. It was like, oh, it wasn't to like make us better, happier people and like make a better society. It was like to train people to go into the workforce in the way we needed them. Um, I think so much of the way we structure societies is, is based on this internalized notion that capitalism is the right way to go. It's like the moral way to go, and it's definitely the way to increase our well-being. But I think this comes from some of our mistaken intuitions. If you dig into the stuff we don't realize is good for happiness, but really is essential for it, it's things like having some bandwidth. It's things like having some time off. It's things like being present. It's, it's prioritizing our social relationships. It's not self-care, but doing care for others, right? It's being community-minded. Like, none of that stuff is built into the structure of capitalism. None of that stuff is built into the structure of ed our education system, for the most part. And so I think this view of thinking about what really matters for happiness doesn't just give us interventions we can use on ourselves to feel better. You know, I should be more present or I should be more social. It also causes us to start rethinking structurally the way we want society to be designed, right? Because so many of the structures we've built aren't necessarily maximizing well-being. Um, they're kind of, you know, maximizing shareholder profits, for example, not to sound too Marxist, but, but I think once we start thinking from the perspective of what science really tells us about um, becoming happier, it causes us to question our institutions. Um, and this is really critical because, you know, like, I don't think, you know, over time as we built these institutions, we were trying to do anything bad. We were just using our intuitions about what would make for a good society. But I think what the science shows us is that those intuitions are systematically off, right? They're systematically not paying attention to certain features that would make us happy. And so in some sense, it's no surprise that we design things that are kind of sucky and that are sort of stealing our well-being. But if you understand the right way to do things, it suggests, again, not just intervening to change your own happiness and to improve your own well-being, but it suggests strongly that we need, might need to restructure some of these institutions um, to make for happier societies over time. Yeah, and I think the beautiful thing is that, you know, we're in control and we can step we can step in, we can speak up. I love being, you know, separately from being a podcast host, which I just do for fun. I love building businesses. I love employing people. I love leveraging the tools of capitalism. And again, I get to create my own definition out of it. Maybe it's conscious capitalism. Maybe it's thinking about the different stakeholders that are there that normally is not taught about in business school and seeing how can we take care of everybody? Because when everybody wins, we're at a better you know, society uh, that's there. So I think that that's a beautiful reminder that we can step into it and we can make this what we want it to be. And we don't just have to blindly follow the past. So I want to shift. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I think that's one of the awesome things about this awful crisis of COVID-19 that we're all facing as you and I are having this conversation right now in the middle of like June 2020, right? I mean, obviously, this is an awful virus that's taking people's lives and it's hurting people's livelihoods. But I think it's kind of forced us to hit pause on things in this interesting way, right? Like it's forced us to ask like, 
could our lifestyles look different? Could the way businesses work look different? You know, do we have to be, you know, polluting as much as we have been and contributing to climate change as much as we have been? Like maybe we, you know, don't have to drive to work today, maybe all the time, like maybe we could work from home. Like, and so I don't know if we've gotten answers to those questions, but I think COVID-19 has been this interesting moment that's given us space to imagine what a new society could be like. It's also given some of us time and the bandwidth to imagine that, right? Because we've kind of hit pause on like the normal speeding through capitalist lifestyle that many of us face. And I think in the moment of doing that, we could ask, okay, what do we want our systems to look like? Um, you know, when this is all over and everything kind of reopens or we kind of reimagine society kind of post COVID-19, you know, are there changes that we want to make structural changes, big changes, as well as personal changes to our own life and how we live that, you know, might improve our well-being. Well said. And I think in addition to the, you know, we're talking about capitalism. I think it's also institutionalism. Anything that's an institution, regardless of what institution is following, you can have institutionalism in religion. You can have institutionalism, you know, my background is I'm from India. There was the caste system that was there. That was an institution through combination of religion and state to keep people, you know, in one particular group and not have upward mobility. So any institution that is suppressing the natural flow of things is always going to be against what's in the best interest of, of human beings. And this is really a time period for us questioning all institutions. It's like, do we need this same type of hierarchy here? Or do we want to let people go and create something new that others can get a chance to experience? So I, I want to shift for, uh, I want to shift to other subjects that you covered. What does, the literature teach us about happiness, joy, and contentment when it comes to the relationships in our lives? Yeah, well, I think the literature is pretty clear on this, which is important. I mean, as you know, in psychology, you know, there's always, you know, you know, some evidence that kind of goes in the opposite direction. This is one where I feel like literally every study I've read in positive psychology points in the same direction, which is that relationships are a key to happiness. Um, one very famous study say, said that high social connection is a necessary and sufficient condition for happiness, right? Like happy people just have strong relationships. Um, and the opposite of that kind of feeling lonely, we know is awful for well-being, but also awful for our physical health. Um, the recent Surgeon General uh, once reported that loneliness is almost as bad for your physical health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, right? And, you know, we have a whole anti-smoking campaigns, but we don't have as much of a like campaign that's like pro-social connection, you know, work less hours at work so you can like see your family or, you know, make sure you're prioritizing social connection in your life. That's going to be as important for living a good life as getting the perfect job and so on. And so, you know, the data really suggests that that kind of connection is critical. And it's also kind of the kind of connection we get, not just, I mean, part of it's kind of being around people and having these strong relationships, but part of it is really being less focused on yourself and just more other oriented in general. And I think this is another spot where our society totally gets it wrong. You know, we all have notions of kind of self care or treat yourself. If you watch parks and recs, you know, this is like, you know, people have t-shirts with this stuff, like treat yourself. But the data from happy people suggest happy people aren't as focused on treating themselves. They treat themselves by helping other people. You know, they donate more to charity. They give their time to volunteer causes. You know, the path to true well-being seems to come from being other oriented rather than being selfish. We are all disconnected from our authentic heart. And how do I know that? Because we just have to look at the state of our planet. The state of our planet would not be the way it is if we as humans did not globally and individually participate in our own severance from our heart. So where did I get unworthiness? I got it from my culture. You know, it's like it's everywhere. Our culture predicates, the capitalism predicates on our consumerism. Our consumerism predicates on our lack. Where does our lack come from? From our fear. Our fear is again predicated on a deep resistance to our our own being, to our the fact that we will die, the fact that we'll grow old, the fact that we're going to get wrinkles and cellulite. We can't all be billionaires. So that scarcity, that feeling of unworthiness is at the core upon which then we participate in consumerism and achieving and success and go for the gold medal and go for the pot at the end of the rainbow. And then that is how capitalism turns its wheels. So we feed it, 
it feeds us back because there's never any end to consuming. And because the core is that we feel unworthy. So unless we understand that we will always feel unworthy, there's no amount of wrinkle cream that is going to take that away. There's no fancy man or woman in a Bentley or Rolls Royce that can come and take that away. And as long as we're looking for worth on the outside, which is what consumerism is predicated on, you know, buying the creams, buying the cars, looking for the next ladder, we will perpetuate what we are perpetuating, an entire globe of great malfunction and disconnect. And our children are being more uh, driven and to success and competition than ever before. Therefore, they're more anxious than ever before. We, this generation is more anxious than ever before. I was asked to write a book with my co-author, Superpowered, three years before the pandemic, because the rates of anxiety in children were skyrocketing. So now after the pandemic, they are probably on steroids. So we are you know, surrounded in this culture of tremendous lack. And it then, then consumerism comes and then greed comes and then capitalism comes and profit is the only goal. And that's why we've decimated our children, our earth, our species. You know, we're, we're not in a good place right now in terms of well-being. And, uh, you know, the earth's resources are drying up because our inner connection to ourself is severed. What role does our early so that's like the global right we're zooming out and we're seeing the global sort of sense of it let's yeah. so that's the macro let's bring it down to the micro let's just talk yeah. on a, on a, just a human level yeah. you know the human levels of you're very open and honest in your book about some of the drivers that were in your life in yeah. societal parent parental upbringing of needing to be the good girl that put everybody else first right yes yeah, so so, so, so let's bring it down to the micro. What were some of the conditions that what were some of the things that you saw growing up or what are some of the things that you heard growing up that played a part in that? Oh my God. Thank you for bringing me back to the micro. So yes, um, growing up, for example, I heard these things, but other people can reflect on what they heard. But I heard so much focus on my external looks, so much. I mean, I walked into a room, they would comment on whether I was fat or thin compared to the last time. I walked into the room, they would tell me whether my hair was shiny or not. I mean, Indian culture is known to do this. We all can't stand it, but it still continues generation after generation where people feel they have the audacity, audacious right to comment about, about every part of your body. Then we were in India, especially, Oh, my goodness. Through the movies we saw, through our aunties, through the parties that women ate last. I saw that. I saw that the woman would, the mother, the wife would be in the kitchen and she would be making the hot food. And everyone else starts before. Uh, my mother did this. And I thought she was the most amazing mother for doing it. Nobody ever asked her to sit at the table because we all wanted her hot food. But nobody ever said, hey, Let's find a trade-off. This is not okay with us. Let's negotiate. Nobody said it. It was expected and understood, and we thrived on it. And as a young girl, I absorbed the message that to be self-abnegating is virtuous. So then, so external focus uh, on the on the beauty, on the physical appearance, on self-abnegation, uh, and then on you know the focus that girls need to keep the harmony. You know. We need to always suffer in silence and sacrifice our feelings because we want to keep everyone happy. This is how we were raised. It, it was in literally everywhere I turned. This is my this was my message. So whether my individual two parents tried to help me be free or not almost didn't matter because their voice was drowned out. And uh, so then, as I grew up and wanted to assert myself. <coughs> Those messages played back and interrupted my capacity to step into my power. It created doubt. It created ambivalence. And then I was in a, in a hamster wheel of complete, uh, uh, you know, self, uh, you know, crit criticism. How can you want to speak up when you should be a family harmonizer? How can you want to speak up when you're pissing other people off? So this internal conflict was almost too hard to bear. So I just silenced the conflict by never trying to speak up. It was just easier to follow than contend with this inner conflict. 
I think this is a good opportunity to make the distinction and really talk about inside the book, you, you early on, and we'll come back and unpack that story a little bit more. You talk about being a victim versus victimhood. And I think this is a great place to start off with because some of what we're going to get into is going to be segmenting a little bit of the difference b- between those two. And so I'd love to introduce that in. Why did you write about that? And what is the difference between the two? So <clears throat> there is such a, an objective reality of being a victim, of being a victim of perpetration, being a victim of, su- of slaughter, being a victim of rape, being a victim of the Holocaust, being a victim of slavery, and being a victim of the ones who were in the Me Too movement. We women have been so stigmatized against this word victim that when we are victims, we don't speak up and we don't allow our daughters to speak up were they to become victims of true crimes. It's no shame to say I'm a victim, especially victims of domestic abuse. We feel so scared to to own that as women because it brings shame to the family and it somehow bears badly on us. But I wrote that in the book to empower women to say, no shame on me. I was a victim of rape. No shame on me. I was a victim of molestation. I was a victim of physical or emotional abuse. Now, what is victim consciousness or victimhood idness is when we now internalize the oppression to the point where we are actually continuing that reality of oppression in our own lives. So that is the way we continue a victim consciousness. And in doing that, we don't realize that we actually give back our power to our oppressor because we still keep reliving in that experience and we don't know how to take our power back. So that is victim consciousness that I teach women to step up against and to push back against and to heal against. So that is very, very key that we do that. Power seems like a through line in the book, right? This idea. I mean, there's many through lines that are inside of the book and we'll touch on a bunch of them, but let's just touch on power for a second. What what is important for people to know about this topic of, of power when it comes to their own awakening? Oh, so power really is uh, from the word empowerment, because typically power has also got a negative connotation of domination. So I speak a lot about power in terms of empowerment, which means that we can become co-creators in our lives and understand that the reason we are in any emotional experience, not physical, if I'm running in Central Park and I get raped, I didn't co-create that. I co-create everything that happens after my rape, but I don't co-create the rape. So I distinguish between physical co-creation and emotional co-creation. All our emotional experiences are co-created, co-created, because that mental real estate Uh, is something that we can choose to share with others or not. And what we put on on the land inside ourselves depends on us. So empowerment occurs when you realize that you are a co-creator of your emotional life. And that is such a difficult thing to get. But when you get it, you can break free. So I'll give it through an example. A woman came to me complaining that her husband was so narcissistic and so controlling and so dominating and she's so angry. You know, a lot of women come like that. And um, they want empathy. And I, of course, give them empathy. But my empathy is very limited because I don't want to create codependency. I don't want to create the idea that she is a victim in victim consciousness of this. So most emotional abuse is when we stay in victim consciousness. And I wanted to show her she is not a victim here. She is in victim consciousness because it's emotional and mental abuse. It's not physical. So first I distinguished all these things for her. And then I told her that the only reason that this narcissist is in your life or this abuser is in your life or this negative boss is in your life 
is because you are fully co-participating in your childhood role right now. You are recreating your childhood emotional experience by fully, you get an A plus in how well you are executing your role of being the counterbalance to the narcissist. The narcissist cannot continue more than 30 days in any relationship that doesn't foster him or her. And that's where our empowerment comes in, in examples like this, where you realize, oh, why am I not speaking up? Oh, why didn't I ask for the raise? Why didn't I leave the room? Why didn't I report the person to the police? Because somewhere we get sidetracked by the messages from culture, like I said I did, which throw you off course. You, you have an inner knowing, but then you get thrown off course and you enter this psych cyclonic self-doubt, ambivalence, equivocation. And then you're like, forget it. I'd rather just not even speak up, leave it. So our inner knowing needs to be honed, needs to be cultivated. And that's when you begin to become really empowered, when you take charge of your own emotional experiences. And you've used some examples that, you know, I mean, when we look at the stick statistics, especially after a lot of what we saw after the Me Too movement, of course, the, these sexual abuse and domestic violence is way more prominent than most people understood. And even if there's somebody that's listening here that says, well, that hasn't happened to me, even the small examples that you share about in the book of saying yes to something that you don't want to do, right? Why, yes. why do we say yes to something? Because the pressure, the components, the, the, daily, the daily items that come through our plate in our world that have us contradict what our gut intuition is. And, and I feel like we can't really talk about those without talking about the ego. And there's an opening section where you kind of like really help people understand like what the ego is. So where does victim consciousness and the ego intersect and what is their relationship? Okay. That's a kind of deep question. So give me a few minutes to explain. So the ego, I always say is like the egg surround the shell surrounding the, the chicken in an egg. And what that means is that the chicken needs that shell to survive. But if that shell stays for too long, the chicken will die. It needs to crack. Everyone's ego needs to crack. So then one might ask, why the hell is it there in the first place? Well, it's here in our life. De novo, all of us have it because in our childhoods, we were raised pretty much unconsciously un un unconsciously to follow the traditions of our parents and culture. And because of that, we all had to survive, not thrive so much, but survive to get love and worth. And we put on these masks, these roles, you know, achiever, provider, competitor, athlete, musician, and those roles gave us adulation, gave us the worth that we were so missing. And, but the good thing about the ego is it also allowed us to survive. It also allowed us to grow up in this very bitter, difficult world sometimes. However, because it's based on a false identification, because we can never be our role through, you know, are you a parent yet through? Not yet, no. Yeah, even though you will love being a parent, and you're like, this is the most important thing, even that is not going to be your essence. And this is a big lesson for us to realize because we believe that our kids are our identity, our wife or partner are our identity, or our career is our identity. But Eastern spirituality has taught us that our only identity is a limitless, expansive, spacious essence, which doesn't cling to anything. So in ch childhood, all we did was cling to the identity, you know? And that's why when we grow up, we then push those people who give us our identity or the things that give us our identity to keep giving us our identity. So anytime they don't give us our identity, so you wanted the raise, but you didn't get the raise, now your identity is in jeopardy. You wanted the fabulous, fantastic, A-grade child. Guess what? You got an ordinary kid. Now your identity is in jeopardy. So this is why it's so precarious to place our worth on our identity. Identity is false sense of self. So even in today's world, they ask, you know, how do you identify? And I understand 
why they're asking that. But it's tricky because even if we are identifying as whatever we're identifying, ultimately it is still an identity. It's not who we truly are. Who we truly are is identityless. You know, you are not Drew Perohit. You are just an essence and a, a being that yearns to be known for just your essence. And you're not Drew Perohit, this fabulous business entrepreneur and this podcaster. You are just essence. And we've gone so far from essence by creating all these roles that we've all gotten lost. Okay, so now victim consciousness comes in when that identity gets attacked. So when that identity gets attacked, we dip, we fall, and we then wonder why we're feeling so anxious because the identity was attacked. So what I do in my life, because I meditate and I understand the principles of emptiness, is that I move away from identities. I don't want to be identified. You know, so people always ask me, you know, can I do, you know, are you a psychologist and what should I describe you as? And I just say, you know, Dr. Shivali is enough and you can drop the doctor, you know, and you can even call me Natasha if you want. I really don't care. Just we're going to have a conversation from our essence. And we have become a world that has forgotten simple conversations, essence to essence. It's all about the likes and the popularity and it's seductive, but it's empty, empty of essence. Our true essence is with emptiness. I mean, I'm using the word empty, but there's an empty, but then there's an emptiness, which is our essence, meaning it is devoid of identity. Talk to us about rock bottom, because rock bottom, you've shared before that it can be a gift. And I bring up rock bottom as the next thing to get into, because in one way, our ego attaching to all these different identities is, is painful and there's a lot of suffering that comes with it. On another side is that if we're quote unquote lucky enough, we may hit rock bottom, which is very scary for a lot of people, but actually you say that it could be a gift. Tell us why. Because when we hit rock bottom, what that really means is that we are forced to look at who we are without the identity. We typically hit rock bottom because one of our role identifications has gone into the gutter. Either our kid is on drugs or our partner left us or the job fired us. You know, it's typically, I'm just being very broad. And we think we are unhappy because the kid is a drug addict. Yeah, I'm sure that's very alarming. But the real rock bottom is coming because we don't know who we are without that fantasy, without that identity of the successful entrepreneur, the successful parent or the successful wife or husband. And that identity has been shattered. That's why we're at rock bottom, because finally the identity identification has shattered against the rock. And finally we are, we are, forced to ask bare and naked who are we now and it's exciting because now the real you that has been yearning to come all this time has the chance to finally resurface hey youtube if you enjoyed what you just saw keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Fear is a is a terrific motivator and i think that we're so afraid of things like adrenal burnout or, or chronic stress, and, and those things are problematic for many people. But I think that fear